Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining an intimate conversation with leading climate scientists to discuss groundbreaking new research on global warming, uh, particularly the uh, the paper that is now live today on global warming uh, in the pipeline. I am pleased to introduce uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, Director of the Center of Sustainable Development at Columbia University and President of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network will be moderating uh, this webinar. So Jeff, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really uh, thrilled and I'm only going to speak for a moment because we have a very important paper and uh, several of the authors of this important paper on global warming in the pipeline. It's a complicated paper. The message is extremely important, uh, but I think it needs uh, all of the time of the scientists to explain uh, this paper to us. We're going to hear from uh, several of the authors, uh, starting with the lead author, uh, James Hansen of Columbia University, uh, and of course, uh, the longtime uh, lead uh, climate scientist for the US government and for NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Uh, and then we'll hear from several colleagues and uh, and uh, co-authors of this very important paper. Uh, we are just weeks before the world will gather uh, in Dubai for <coughs> COP28, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so the message uh, of this uh, groundbreaking uh, paper is uh, extremely important. And Jim, if I could turn it over to you uh, to start us off, uh, I would be most grateful. Thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, thanks to your people and uh, your program for hosting uh, this discussion. We're honored. And I, I also want to, if I can go to the next chart, I want to thank my uh, co-authors for their unique scientific expertise and contributions to this paper, and uh, the editor-in-chief uh, of Oxford Open Climate Change, uh, Ilko Rowling for inviting me to include my perspective about policy implications, which is the final section of the paper. Uh, could I have the next chart? So the climate on our remarkable home planet is characterized by delayed response and amplifying feedbacks, which is a recipe to lock in intergenerational injustice. So we climate scientists have an obligation to explain this situation clearly as best we can, especially to young people, and to include the policy implications. Because if we don't include the implications, people who have a special financial interest will make their own conclusions. Uh, the next chart. In 1979, the Charney Report of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences estimated, based on climate models, that global climate sensitivity was three degrees Celsius for doubled atmospheric CO2, but a very large uncertainty. Soon thereafter, it was realized that a much more reliable measure of climate sensitivity could be obtained empirically from the precise knowledge of glacial to interglacial CO2 change provided by ice core data. But this empirical evaluation also requires knowledge of global average glacial to interglacial temperature change. And that remained uncertain because of a misleading evaluation of glacial sea surface temperatures that persisted for 40 years. The wrong assumption was that microscopic species in the ocean surface layer would migrate as climate changed. So they would always be at the temperature they prefer today, rather than partly adapt over millennia to temperature change. Now, recently, Jessica Tierney and her then postdoc, Matt Osmond, who is our uh, co-author, 
developed a global temperature analysis omitting the biology data, but using widespread geochemical proxies, isotopes. And Alan Seltzer used noble gas abundances in groundwater from last glacial maximum at latitudes 45 south to 35 north to evaluate uh, global temperatures, or glacial temperatures. In our paper, we show that the Tierney Osman and Seltzer analyses are consistent, implying a glacial to interglacial temperature change of about seven degrees Celsius. So uh, next chart, we now know the surface temperature during the glass, last glacial maximum and the forcings that maintained the ice age cold. Together, these imply a climate sensitivity of about 4.8 degrees Celsius for doubled CO2. IPCC's best estimate of three degrees is excluded with greater than 99% confidence. This high climate sensitivity has major implications for global warming in the pipeline. The next chart, clouds, which uh, George will talk about in a minute, are the mechanism in climate models that permits a broad range of climate sensitivities. So the next chart, uh, Oh, the, uh, no, you have, uh, no, I actually go back to the one that you just had. Uh, so, <laughs> wait a minute, if climate sensitivity is high, how can climate models with a smaller climate sensitivity, which is most models, obtain realistic global warming for the past century? The answer, the second of the two important climate forcings, aerosols, are an unmeasured free parameter, and models with low climate sensitivity can compensate by understating the aerosol cooling. So can I have the next one? So aerosols are, are fine airborne particulates. They are a health hazard, killing several million people per year. Aerosols also cool the climate by reflecting sunlight to space their main effect being as condensation nuclei or cloud drops. They slightly increase cloud cover and make clouds a bit brighter. Humanity made a Faustian bargain by offsetting a substantial but uncertain fraction of greenhouse gas warming with aerosol cooling. Now, as we want to reduce all uh, the chronic health effects of aerosols, our first Faustian payment is due. The payment is acceleration of global warming. Next chart, China reduced its aerosols in the past 15 years, and aerosols from ships decreased in 2015, and especially in 2020 as Leon will describe in, in a few minutes. So we expect the post 2010 global warming rate to increase at least 50%, which is the lower edge of the yellow area. If we are right, the 12 month running mean temperature will rise above the yellow region by next spring as the current El Nino peaks. The mean temperature for the rest of this decade will be at least 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. And two degrees Celsius global warming will be reached within 20 years thereafter. Uh, the next chart. Although uh, aerosol climate, for although aerosol climate forcing is unmeasured, there's a great inadvertent aerosol experiment now ongoing that helps to educate us. The International Maritime Organization imposed regulations on the sulfur content of ship fuels in 2015 and tightened the regulations in 2020, in 2020. 
This should have a detectable effect on clouds, decreasing cloud cover and cloud brightness, and thus increasing the sunlight absorbed by Earth, especially in the North Pacific and North Atlantic regions where shipping is the source of a large fraction of the sulfate aerosols. The next chart, the satellite data, which Norman uh, will talk about, suggests that absorbed solar radiation is increasing. It's highly variable because of natural variations of cloud patterns, such as the Pacific dec Decadal Oscillation. But since the strong regulations on ships went in effect in 2020, solar radiation absorbed by Earth has increased about three watts per meter squared in the North Pacific and North Atlantic. The next chart, on global average, the solar radiation absorbed by Earth has increased about one watt per meter squared. The next chart, this increase of absorbed solar radiation is the reason that Earth's energy imbalance has almost doubled since 2015. When I gave a TED talk uh, more than a decade ago, Earth's energy imbalance was about six tenths of a watt per square meter, which is equivalent to 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, that much energy being poured mostly into the ocean. That imbalance has now doubled. That's why global warming will accelerate. That's why global melting will accelerate. Now the next chart, let's, uh, let's look at the absorbed solar radiation again. If this is not noise, and I don't think it is noise, this one watt increase is a BFD, a big fucking deal. Let's compare it with greenhouse gas climate forcing. The next chart, the greenhouse gas climate forcing on the next chart has increased about 0 0.045 watts per meter squared per year, which is almost half a watt per decade. So the one watt increase of absorbed solar radiation is equivalent to more than a 20 year increase of greenhouse gases at their current high rate of increase. That's why I can say with confidence that global warming will now accelerate. Let's first look uh, at greenhouse gases. Uh, several uh, years ago, IPCC defined a scenario, RCP 2.6, aimed at keeping global warming less than two degrees Celsius. And Pushkar will comment on the modeling assumptions that lead to such uh, drastically declining greenhouse gas emissions. But the real world overshot the plan. We could close the gap by extracting CO2 from the air, but the annual cost now has reached 3.5 to $7 trillion based on estimates of David Keith on uh, CO2 extraction. The cost of offsetting the decreased aerosol cooling would be 115 to $230 trillion. Conclusion, the two degrees Celsius global warming limit is dead. Unless we take purposeful actions to alter Earth's energy imbalance. The next chart. The first thing uh, that we must do is reduce emissions as rapidly as possible. But fossil fuels are providing most of the world's energy, almost 80%. The next chart, most of 
today's emissions and future emissions are from emerging economies, nations that want to raise their living standards. The next chart, the task uh, to reduce, no, actually, let's go back one chart to the yellow and blue one. Uh, Yeah, as I said, most of today's emissions are from emerging economies. So we can go to the next chart. The task is to reduce the carbon intensity of uh, global energy to near zero. But we reduced it only from 0.8 to 0.7 in the past half century. It's not plausible for it to go to near zero by mid-century. Sweden did well by decarbonizing its electricity in part by building nuclear power plants. Now, my last chart on the fundamental required actions, none of these are occurring. A rising carbon fee is the fastest, most effective way to affect all uses of fossil fuels. But the fossil fuel industry has prevented it. Instead of East-West cooperation, our politics and special interests have led to a focus on economic and military hegemony, which is foolish because we're all in the same boat and we'll sink together if we don't work together. I don't think that anyone asks young people if, that, if this confrontational approach is the kind of world they wish to aim for. The 1.5 degree limit is deader than a doornail and the two degree limit can be rescued only with the help of purposeful actions to affect Earth's energy balance. We will need to cool off Earth to save our coastlines, coastal cities worldwide and lowlands, while also addressing the other problems caused by global warming. Now, it will take uh, several years for socialization of uh, what is needed for the public to understand, which will be aided by the increasing problems that they will see from global warming. That several years will provide the time that young people need to understand this matter. And specifically, the fact that I believe a political party that takes no money from special interest is probably an essential part of the solution. Young people should not underestimate their political clout. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, could you, uh, just before we turn to uh, George, uh, just say a word about the 1.5 degree C uh, target and the two degree? You said uh, that it's it's dead. Could you uh, just explain quantitatively what you mean by well, that to help people understand where we are and where we are heading right now? Well, in the next several months, we're going to go well above 1.5 C on a 12-month average. Now, as it, we go from the El Nino to the La Nina, it will drop back below the, the yellow region that I showed in my chart and may fall as low as 1.4 to 1.3. But for the rest of this decade, the average is going to be at least 1.5. We know that because the planet is now out of balance by an incredible amount, more than it ever has been, you know, it's doubled. So you've got a huge amount of incoming energy. That, that's what causes the temperature change. 
Uh, so 1.5 degrees is already uh, is it's going it's going to be occurring in the next several months, and the average over the next several years will be at least that level. If if there's more energy coming in than going out, the planet is going to get warmer, and we're already at that level. And the uh, so far as two degrees is concerned, it yeah you you can see that the attempts to make a plan for how you could stay under two degrees. We're shooting way over that. And that was without considering the effect of this additional imbalance caused by aerosols being reduced. So there's, as Pushkar will show, that the scenarios that you would need to stay under two degrees are just not, they're imaginary. And the aerosol just complicates it further. So uh, we can do it. We, we, we will have to do it. But it's going to require the combination of reducing emissions as rapidly as possible. But also, if we're going to avoid Antarctic, you know, there's a, well, I, I shouldn't go into details. But if we're going to keep sea level close to where it is, we actually have to cool the planet. We can't allow it to continue to be out of balance the way it is now because it's melting the ice shelves and we're going to lose the West Antarctic ice sheet if we don't cool the planet off. Thank you, uh, Grim. And we'll come back to this uh, in uh, the Q&A, no doubt, and in the conclusions. But let's turn to George uh, Seliudis uh, at uh, uh, NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Studies, who's going to talk to us about the cloud modeling that is a part of the, the, the new insights uh, showing uh, this increased uh, climate sensitivity. So over to you, George. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about uh, clouds and their role in determining climate sensitivity. Um, when we went from uh, the older generation of climate models, the CIMIP-5 models, to the CIMIP-6 models, one thing we noticed right away was that uh, uh, climate sensitivity increased. And uh, there was a big effort to try and understand why CIMIP-6 models are generally warmer than, than the CIMIP-5 ones. And the chart on the left is, is, is showing you, uh, I think, our best uh, estimate at why this is happening. Uh, what you see on the left is the CIMIP uh, um, five models, that are the blue models. This is the, the, the change in cloud uh, feedback. Basically, it's cloud warming versus cloud cooling. So anything above zero is warming, anything below zero is cooling. So um, you see that uh, the blue models uh, are cooler than, uh, than the red models or yellowish models, which are the CIMIP-6 models, mostly because of what is happening in the Southern Ocean, because of what is happening south of 30 degrees south, between 30 degrees and 90 degrees south, uh, where uh, the new climate models, the CIMIP-6 models, are warming the, the planet a lot more uh, than the CIMIP-5 models. So uh, the feedback in the Southern Ocean is the main reason that the CIMIP-6 uh, models have uh, higher climate sensitivity than the CIMIP-5 models. Well, now the question that uh, we need to resolve is uh, because what I'm showing you here, the line is the, the average of a number of models. Some of them have higher sensitivities, some of them have lower sensitivities. So I'm showing you the average, which uh, takes into account all of them. The question is, which models are more reliable? Uh, which ones are the ones that we can believe uh, more than, than the others? So uh, we're focusing on the Southern Ocean to try and understand how well the models are doing clouds in the Southern Ocean. And this is what the, the chart on the right is showing you. Uh, so the, the chart on the right is showing you a uh, low cloud cover uh, in the whole world, basically, going from 60 south to 60 north, if you go from bottom to top, for every month, going from January to December. And the, the uh, panel on the left is the climate models that have high climate sensitivity. 
The panel in the middle are climate models that have low climate sensitivity. And the panel on the right is observations. So basically, uh, what you want to do is compare the panel on the right with the two panels on the left and see which one you believe more. Uh, well, just by looking, first of all, at, at the colors, uh, which are showing you the, the cloud cover, you will see that the panel on the left resembles a lot more the panel uh, on the right than the middle one. The middle one seems to have a lot less uh, low clouds uh, throughout uh, the globe uh, than, the, than the observations or the, on, or the high climate sensitivity models. So the high climate sensitivity models are making low clouds a lot better than the low climate sensitivity models. And, uh, and uh, any modeler would, would, would trust the model much more when it's more realistic. Not only do they make uh, better low clouds, the high sensitivity models, but they also make the seasonal variation better. For example, look at how clouds change uh, with, uh, with the, the season on the right in the observations. Uh, in the Southern Ocean, which is uh, the, the area that we want to focus most, you will see that the observation shows that uh, clouds increase in, uh, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere summer, basically, uh, June, July, August, uh, from May to, to August or September, uh, and they decrease in, in the two uh, between uh, January and March and, and after September. So uh, if we look at the models, the high sensitivity models, they do the same thing. They increase their clouds during, uh, during the summer season, the Northern Hemisphere summer. However, the low sensitivity models are doing the opposite. They decrease their clouds. Not only they don't have the right amount of clouds, but they also decrease them uh, at the right at the long season. So uh, this is telling us that the high sensitivity models are doing a better job uh, of producing those clouds that according to the left panel are really important uh, in order to, to understand climate sensitivity. So this is why we believe that sensitivity is around uh, even above 4.5. Th those high sensitivity models have sensitivities about 4.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, sensitivities above 4.5 degrees are, are uh, better, are more reliable as far as climate feedbacks are concerned. And just one last point to make here is that you see here that I'm trying to understand this by using seasonal variability because with seasons, things change a lot. We need a lot more detail in our cloud observations in order to take the last 40 years and, and understand the changes over this, this time period. However, uh, the way we're going is we're reducing the, um, basically the funding spend and, and the, and the um, missions, the satellite missions that are needed in order to try and understand this, this cloud feedback and cloud and aerosol interactions. And this is something that's worrisome. We are at a very uh, critical position, at a very critical time. Uh, we need to make decisions fast about our future. And at the same time, we're reducing our capability to observe the planet uh, the way that we, in the detail that we need in order to understand what is going on. And this is, uh, to me, uh, a very uh, counterproductive, in order not to use a, uh, a worse uh, uh, policy to follow at this critical time, reducing our, our investment in observing the Earth from space is, uh, is, uh, is exactly the wrong thing to do. George, uh, thank, 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 thank you very much. Uh, very important uh, and also alarming on uh, both the dimensions of uh, what you're finding and what we're uh, not measuring. Let me turn to uh, Dr. Pushkar uh, Karecha uh, at the uh, Columbia University Climate School. Uh, and I think, uh, Pushkar, you're going to talk about uh, the comparison of the new paper and the IPCC uh, climate sensitivity IPCC estimates. Climate sensitivity. Uh, well, so, so somewhat related, yes. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the comparison of uh, the reason basically why I integrated assessment models and IPCC mitigation scenarios stretch plausibility. So, okay, so uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, just the I wanted to briefly describe the general framework of integrated assessment models shown here as a flowchart. Um, 
uh, the output of which is used to drive uh, global climate models and generate mitigation scenarios. Uh, these models overall are useful, of course, uh, but they contain, in my view, many dubious assumptions. Uh, and the ones I'm going to focus on um, here are technology availability and implementation. And the bottom line, this has led to an over-reliance, in my view, on unproven met mitigation methods, uh, including large-scale uh, BECs, or bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage, and DAX, uh, direct air uh, carbon capture and storage, and other negative emissions technologies or carbon dioxide removal methods. So in terms of just the core mitigation problem we face as a world, I think this figure from the IPCC report, the, the most recent one, AR6, uh, summarizes things very nicely. It shows the cumulative emissions from existing and planned fossil fuel infrastructure alone uh, on the left. And um, on the right, the gray bars show the remaining allowable carbon budgets in the one and a half and two degree mitigation scenarios. And so what we see from that is basically the cumulative emissions, if we just look at existing and planned fossil fuel infrastructure, they already exceed essentially the entire range that's um, consistent with the one and a half degree scenario. And uh, even a good chunk of the remaining budget associated with the two degree scenario. So the clear and immediate implication of this is that existing fossil fuel sources fossil fuel in infrastructure must be either phased down or decommissioned outright. And uh, the planned projects essentially have to be canceled. So in terms of um, uh, the CO2 emissions that are projected by IAMs and used to generate um, mitigation scenarios and drive global climate models, uh, they show very, uh, this is another figure from the same IPCC report, they show very large increases in, in very uncertain uh, negative emission sources uh, that I mentioned in both the land and energy sectors over the next few decades across most scenarios, at least especially on the stringent side, the one and a half degree scenarios. Uh, so this, uh, the basic problem with this approach is that it does not sufficiently address other co conflicts with other environmental and social goals, namely sustainable development, food production, water use, and so on. So in summary, um, in terms of reality versus uh, mitigation scenarios and IAMs, there's good news and bad news. On the bright side, clean energy sources are uh, very rapidly and substantially increasing all around the world, uh, especially in the countries we need them most, uh, namely the top CO2 emitters. Uh, but the time scale of required growth of these sources in both the one and a half and two C uh, scenario sets seems unrealistic. Um, for example, if you look at the increase just this past decade, uh, excuse me, the increase that's required this decade uh, in either the one and a half or two degrees uh, scenarios, it has to equal or exceed the increase over the entire last three decades. And meanwhile, on the downside, unfortunately, fossil fuel emissions are, of course, still rising with no peak in sight, at least not anytime soon. So um, the can't hear you anymore. We may have uh, lost uh, Pushkar's connection. OK, uh, I think we have. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, because we are uh, running a little bit late, uh, could I turn to uh, Leon uh, Simons uh, of the Club of Rome uh, to talk about uh, the changes of uh, maritime oh. emissions? Uh, and uh, oh. the, uh, Pushkar, uh, we're going to move uh, quickly to Leon, okay. if that's no all problem. right. No problem. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, to uh, Leon uh, Simons, uh, who will uh, speak about uh, international uh, maritime uh, regulation organization regulations and its implications for uh, the aerosol emissions and those implications for the uh, uh, increase of uh, increased rate of uh, warming. So, uh, Leon, to you, please. Thank you, Jeff. Hi. Yeah. So, as Pushka mentioned. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not decreasing. But there's one thing that is decreasing as 
Jim already referred to, and that's the sulfur emissions. Th these are decreasing much faster than uh, anticipated because um, health and uh, environmental regulations are very successful. Um, why is that important? Here, I, I copied here the, uh, the most important forcing agents from the IPCC, and it shows the, the warming effect from greenhouse gases here, and then the, sol the cooling effect from sulfur dioxide emissions up to 2019. And on the right, you see the, the global sulfur dioxide emissions. And as you can see, most of these emissions are over the Northern hemisphere. That means that the cooling effect of sulfur is mainly focused, if that's, and, and that's the best estimate of the IPCC. And our research shows that it's probably, and you can see there's a very big uncertainty. Our research shows that the cooling effect is most likely stronger than the IPCC estimated. And that, but that's not the whole story because the cooling effect is even stronger over the Northern Hemisphere, where seven of the eight billion people on this planet live, than on the Southern Hemisphere, of course, because on the Northern Hemisphere is where all these, part, uh, these sulfur particles were emitted. And as Jim already mentioned, these, these, these particles, they reflect, uh, the sulfur is, is inside the fuels when, when it's, it's taken out of the ground. And when it's burned, the sulfur enters the atmosphere and it reflects sunlight. And it makes clouds brighter and longer lasting and bigger, and which also reflects more sunlight. And if you reduce these particles, this, the, the burning of these fuels, the emissions will decrease. And then the amount of sol sunlight that's reflected will also decrease, which makes uh, more sunlight being absorbed by the Earth. And then increase, that would increase the warming. Or uh, more accurately, it will hide less of the global warming caused by greenhouse gases. <clears throat> and this is uh, one figure of the paper. Um, this is, uh, here you can see, again, the, the, it is North America, it is Asia, and you see the total sulfate emissions. That's both from natural sources and from human sources. And here on the right, we show uh, the, the emissions which are from shipping. And then you can see that over half of the emissions both natural from algae, for example, and from volcanoes, more than half of these emissions of sulfur uh, are uh, over the North Pacific and over the North Atlantic are from sh shipping. And that's before shipping regulations came into effect. And here I showed it from the International Maritime Organization, the changes in how much sulfur is allowed to be in the fuels ships burn. These are 50,000 very large ships transporting goods all over the world. And in uh, 2010 and 2015, you see that this is the, uh, in the regions in the North, in North Sea and around North America, these emissions were reduced. But globally, the biggest uh, reduction happened in 2020, when the, the, the maximum amount of uh, sulfur that was allowed to be in the fuel uh, went from 3.5% to 0.5%, reducing the sulfur emissions over the oceans by 80%. Here you can see uh, uh, what that means. From 1900 to 2020, this is the sulfur shipping uh, sulfur dioxide emissions in uh, in thousands of tons. And then you can see here they nosedived when these regulations came into effect on January 1st, 2020. And here again, the, the map I've showed before, this is the satellite uh, data from, from NASA, from the series mission. Um, looking at at the, at, at the, how much sunlight comes in from uh, uh, and then from at the top of the atmosphere, how much sunlight comes in, and then how much is reflected, and that means how um, then you can calculate how much net radiation is absorbed. This is the 48th month, month running mean. Now you can see in this region and in in the, this red and this purple region, the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, as Jim already mentioned. There's a big increase of, of about three watts per square meter of of radiation. So the, uh, that means that a lot, a lot more sunlight, a lot more heat is being absorbed. And that, and if you compare that to the southern hemisphere ocean, there we don't see that. So that we we can compare these very large regions of about thirty million square kilometers and uh, about 20, 25 million square kilometers to this large region on the southern hemisphere 
and then we see that of course there's some increase because if, if the earth warms uh, that decreases cloud cover as push uh, 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 as george already showed um and then so there is some also on the southern hemisphere of the oceans there's some decrease in increase or in in the amount of sunlight being absorbed but that's in, on the northern hemisphere that's that especially in recent years has increased much more and there's some there's some variability uh, which is more related to the to, to El Nino and to the um, to the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Maybe Norman can mention uh, talk about that a bit, because um, they found in already in 2021 that uh, the rate of global warming had had doubled, for both from ocean heat content data and from satellite data from the same satellite data. But um, that, they also um, looked at the, at, the, at this effect. But now we see, while we expected it to start decreasing because uh, of El Nino, uh, La Nina, sorry, and and the negative PDO, um, it started increasing instead. And what does it mean for the the world as a whole? That means that more sunlight is rapid. There's a very rapid increase in how much sunlight is being absorbed. That's uh, in yellow, and then in in red, that's outgoing uh, infrared or heat radiation. And the difference is the net imbalance or the Earth's energy imbalance. So how much energy is accumulating on Earth in, on the, in the Earth system? And as Jim already mentioned, that has, has more than doubled even. Especially in the recent, uh, in the past three years, we see it, it's increasing more and more. Opposite of expectations, if you wouldn't include these, these aerosol uh, uh, changes. And then, uh, so if you if you deduct the the amount of absorbed solar radiation, if the, you deduct the outgoing heat radiation, you get a net effect, and that's that's what you see here. That there's a very high increase in how much net uh, energy accumulates on Earth's system, which we call the Earth's energy imbalance. And again, this is this is from satellite data, but it's um, it's supported by evidence from ocean heat content data and other evidence. Thank you. Jeff, you're on mute. Leon, thank you very much. Uh, very clear and very striking. Uh, let's uh, turn quickly to Norman Loeb uh, at NASA to talk about uh, the satellite uh, measurements uh, and, uh, and their current status. Uh, and then we'll uh, turn to Q&A. There is so much material here. A number of people want to ask questions. So let's uh, see if we can squeeze in as many as possible. Okay, can you Norman. hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm going to talk about the, the satellite measurements, uh, specifically CERES, which stands for Clouds and the Earth's Radiant Energy System. Um, so we've seen different versions of this. This is the CERES record, uh, Global Mean All Sky Radiation. I'm showing uh, what we measure. So we observe the reflected solar radiation. We have other instruments at NASA that measure the incoming solar and so the incoming solar minus the reflected solar gives you the absorbed solar. And that's really what fuels the climate system. In the blue, it's the emitted thermal infrared radiation. And that's essentially how Earth sheds heat. And as we heard, the difference between those two or some of these two um, give you the net radiation. And what I'm showing here are anomalies, which are deviations uh, from climatology. And um, the striking thing that we observed with these measurements is this, these trends. We're seeing a very large trend, as we heard, in absorbed solar radiation, a weaker negative trend in terms of more outgoing radiation. Um, and so the net is uh, positive. So there's already a positive energy imbalance, as um, showing in the table below, where it was about half a watt during the first 10 years of series. And uh, during the last 10 years leading up to um, February 2023, it went to one watt. So it's pretty alarming um, and it's very robust because we can compare it with uh, in situ data from ocean heat storage. Um, this is the only record in the world, uh, the only dedicated record, satellite record for Earth radiation in the world. We're it. Um, 
To put this into a different context, you could take the green line I showed in the previous slide and integrate that over the whole globe and then look at the how much energy has been accumulated into the uh, Earth system. And um, this is essentially it. The, the monthly mean is in blue, there's a seasonal cycle, and then the 12 month running average is in red. And to put that into context, the total energy that's been added to the climate system since we started taking series measurements is 60 times greater than the global primary energy consumption. So it's a lot of energy. Most of it, as Jim said, ends up as heat storage in the ocean. About 2% is used to uh, warm the atmosphere, 5 to uh, heat land, and the remainder is used to um, melt snow and ice. And so the implications of this are, are pretty huge for, um, for people living on Earth. So here is the flight schedules. We've been really fortunate to have um, been able to launch so many satellite instruments. So there are six flight models of series, uh, two launched on Terra satellite, it launched in 2029. All of these are five-year nominal missions and truly remarkable. Um, Terra is still going 23 years later, and we anticipate that it'll go uh, through 2026 when it'll run out of fuel. So it's really an engineering marvel. All of the instruments and satellite are doing great. Aqua, similarly, uh, two instruments there. It's um, just over 21 years and will also uh, run until 2026. We have two other series instruments, flight models five and six, that are flying on NOAA satellites, uh, SUMI MPP launched in 2011 and NOAA 20 in 2017. And those are doing great and could go um, pretty far if they're allowed to, but um, there are programmatic constraints, budgetary constraints that uh, make their end life here uncertain. And so we're hoping that these are allowed to continue and overlap with the next uh, instrument that hasn't launched yet, Libra instrument that's gonna launch um, at the end of 2027. It's really important to have these overlap because uh, a gap in the record would really increase the uncertainty. Um, and so after Libra, after its five-year nominal mission, we have nothing planned at this point. And so that means, um, first of all, Libra could be a single point failure. It could be the only satellite flying and um, it'll be beyond its prime mission nine years from now. And so that is concerning. So at NASA Langley, uh, we've been developing uh, innovative small set technology uh, that can continue this record uh, beyond Libra at a much lower cost on a platform that is much more autonomous, on a much smaller platform that's uh, more nimble in terms of launching uh, than has been previously uh, possible with these bigger satellites. And so I hope we get the opportunity to, to fly these uh, satellites um, to continue this very important record. Thank you. Norm Norman, thank you very much. Uh, very, very important and uh, in very interesting. We're, we'll turn to Q&A. Uh, I'd like to call Seth uh, Bornstein uh, of AP first, and then Gloria Dickey of Reuters, then Adam Vaughn of uh, Times of London. So uh, Seth. Yes, thank you. Um, in turn, I have two questions, uh, mostly for uh, Dr. Hansen. Uh, when you re when I reached out to a whole bunch of other uh, mainstream climate scientists, people like Zeke Hosfather and Michael Mann, um, they they said they called your work somewhat hyperbolic. They said it is plausible on the edge of plausible or at the high end of plausible, but not likely. Um, and that might be fair to call some of the those some of the kinder. Um, and so in what is it, but they also, to be honest, say you have a rep, you, you know, your history is of, of being right when you're out on a limb. Why are you right this time, uh, compared to other, you know, compared to the mainstream scientists? And then the second question goes into the, 
20, the, the 2.7, I mean, 0.27 degrees per decade since 2010. Um, well, that was started out as a strong El Nino year. It also ended as a strong La Nina year. Are you cherry picking a start date here? Um, I know NOAA data shows it's 0.27 since 2010. Um, is that why chose why did you choose that date and and how does ENSO factor in to you know when you're looking at that change and and that acceleration? Thank and thank you for doing this. Th thank you, Seth. Yeah. Okay. To start with, um, how how do we get these conclusions and are they fringe? Uh, no, you know, it's very, it's very simple. Uh, the sensitivity is based on now very hard numbers for the, um, for the temperature change between the glacial and interglacial times, which for decades, we thought that the claim was that it was only three to four degrees. We now know that that's wrong, and the uncertainty is small compared to the change. So the physics there is very straightforward. It's it's the real world that's telling us what the equilibrium climate sensitivity is, and that's far better than models in which you can get any answer depending on what cloud feedbacks you put in. Uh, but as George showed, when you when you uh, do improve your cloud physics and make it look more like the real world, it also increases the climate sensitivity. So there's every reason to believe that this is this is not fringe. This is the correct physics, and it's the real world. And it takes it sometimes takes the community a while to catch on. Uh, now the other. There was another thing about the physics. What was the second part of that? Uh, th about uh, the uh, increased uh, warming to 0.27 and the dates uh, that you picked and, and the evidence. Oh, well, that, that was the third part. But let me. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, let sorry. Me, let me answer that third part. Uh, no, if you look at the uh, temperature change since 1970, it's been basically uh, was a straight line. It's linear from 1970 up to the past decade. And the point that we're starting at, I, if, if you saw the charts that uh, Leon showed and um, the, the change in the aerosols occurred from China and from the shipping uh, beginning in about 2010, that's the reason to uh, have that as the hinge point. And it's not at an extreme, at an El Nino or a La Nina. Uh, we take the mean of that curve. So there's no, it's, it's, uh, it is uh, an uh, objective way to do it. And the other part, and this may be what I was forgetting about the second part, the physics is very clear. The warming is due to the planetary energy imbalance. So you got more energy coming in than going out. The planet warms up. We've now got a doubled, we've doubled the imbalance. And that's going to increase the uh, warming rate. Now, it's not simply based on the current imbalance. You have to integrate over time and you're getting some still getting some warming from additions uh to the imbalance that occurred a hundred years ago but as we show quantitatively in the paper you would still expect at least a 50 percent increase in the warming rate and that's what uh, we will we will soon find out because you know the next few years will will show that indeed we do have an acceleration in the uh, global warming rate. Th thank but you. It's based uh, on, on uh, simple good physics. If you just look at the paper, you'll see that. Jim, thank you very much. <clears throat> just to say we're uh, short of time. Uh, 
there are a number of questions that have been uh, asked on the chat and uh, we will share those questions with the authors uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, some of you may get uh, feedback uh, by email. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me ask uh, Gloria Dickey of uh, Reuters uh, to be next. Hi, yes, thank you for doing this. I just wanted to ask to kind of put this into the context of, you know, the global climate diplomacy and upcoming talks at COP28. If 1.5 is indeed dead, so much of the rhetoric, of course, is keeping 1.5 alive. How do you kind of square that with what we're going to see in a few weeks? I mean, are, you know, world leaders kind of living in an, an imaginary world at this point? You know, what should the aims be of these talks? Uh, how long do you expect it will take, you know, kind of policy and discussion to catch up to thinking that 1.5 is dead? Uh, just kind of where do we go from here? Thank you. Yeah, I think that is um, that is a shortcoming of our scientific community to not make clear to the political leaders what the situation is. Um, 1.5 is deader than a doornail, and anybody who understands the physics knows that. And it, when you look at the real, real, the real potential, if you look at the energy story, you, you, you will understand that you, you are not, the rest of the world is not going to suddenly get off of fossil fuels. They're just too convenient. They raise standards of living. Um, as I said a number of times, one gallon of gasoline contains more than 400 hours of labor by a healthy adult. And, uh, and as I, I showed a graph on the, on the carbon intensity of energy, we've, we've reduced it from 0.8 to 0.7 in 50 years. It's not going to go to zero in a few decades. And there are no plans to do that. And as uh, Pushker's uh, uh, charts showed, the assumptions that are made in these integrated assessment models that IPC is using are just <laughs> inconsistent with the real world and what is happening. So it, it, uh, we're, we're also going to pass two degrees. That's clear, unless we take actions to affect the planet's energy balance. And, and all those models, by the way, do not include the decreasing aerosols and the large additional burden that that puts. You know, one watt per meter squared is an enormous uh, a forcing to try to overcome. I, I, it, I, I mentioned that you want to do it by extracting CO2, it costs you more than $100 trillion. It's not going to happen. So we have to, so young people need to understand what they are being handed by the older generation. They can't allow this fake uh, stories to, to mislead them. They're going to actually have to affect the politics so that the special interests do not control, and I'm especially the fossil fuel industry, does not control the future. And in the United States, you can't solve the problem with two political parties that are both taking money from the special interests. I think that in, in my opinion, we're going to have to get a party that takes no money from special interests. And that's the only way we'll get policies that young people want and are needed to assure their future. If I could just add a word, just to be absolutely clear, uh, the fact that 1.5 degrees C is going to be exceeded must be interpreted properly to mean the emergency is much greater than these politicians either know or pretend. It's not that it's less or that there's less reason for action. There's much more reason for action at a much more urgent pace. And that's the real message of all of this. Uh, so it, it's not to exonerate lazy politicians who have done little till now, 
it's to tell them that uh, their fakery is exposed because the rate of warming is higher, the emissions continue to rise, the drama that the planet is entering is much greater than they pretend. And so the action has to be commensurate with that reality. I just want to be absolutely clear that this isn't used to mock the idea of action. It's the opposite. It's to mock the inaction. Uh, it's, it's to say that the emergency is much, much higher than people realize right now. And, and I, I just want to add, uh, add that point. Uh, if we could turn to uh, Adam Vaughn of Times of London. Uh, hi, thanks for doing this. Um, James, I just want to ask a couple of questions. Um, are the five warmest months in a row that we've seen this year a sign of the acceleration you're talking about in your paper? How worried would, should we be by those temperatures? Um, and I just wanted to ask, just to get put your estimate on climate sensitivity in context a bit, if you could do that. Um, so you're saying 4.8 degrees for a doubling of CO2, which is obviously a lot more than the IPCC. I don't think it's, and I'm obviously not a scientist, I don't think it's completely out of line with other literature, is it? So I just wondered if you could just put it in context a little bit with what we've known before. Thank you. I'm not sure I understood the question, but the 4.8 degrees is actually not outside of the IPCC range. They tend to give very large ranges, but they said their best estimate was three degrees Celsius. And it's, it's clear from the real world response to the change in forcings between the glacial and interglacial periods, that three degrees is excluded. It's higher than that. It could be the uncertainty in 1.2 degrees would mean that four degrees Celsius is, an, is a possible sensitivity, but even that is much larger than the three degrees. Now, I, and, I and Jim, may not the, have the, understood the, the question. Yeah, the, the first question was, what should we make of the uh, record-breaking temperatures of, of the recent five months? Is this part of the evidence uh, of what oh. you're arguing? Yeah, absolutely, it is. If you look at the, you know, we, part of the problem is separating signal from noise, and you have a large natural variability of global temperature, especially associated with the tropical uh, cycles, the southern oscillation. But you can minimize that effect of that variability by looking at the peaks of the large El Ninos. And the, the most recent large El Nino was only uh, eight or nine years ago. And yet the warming since then, it's already clear, is going to be comparable to the warming that occurred between the prior super El Ninos, which was uh, more like 18 years. So the rate is, is uh, almost double. And that's not surprising because the uh, planet's energy imbalance is double. So heat is pouring into the planet at twice the rate. And that's, that is a principal reason why we're getting these extremely large month after month global temperatures. Thank you. Uh, could we turn to Grist? Uh, and if we have time, uh, we'll finish up with uh, Alejandro de la Garza at uh, Time Magazine. We're running late, but let's uh, try to get to two more questions in. Hi. Um, yeah, my name and is- If you could be quick, please. Yes, of course. Um, I had a question about tipping points, um, which is, you know, what are the implications of those given um, that your research shows will reach 1.5 by the end of the decade. Thank you. Yeah, the the most important tipping point is the the Antarctic ice sheet, and in particular, the Thwaites uh, Glacier, which whose grounding line has been moving inland at a rate of about a kilometer per year. And 
in, in another uh, 20 years, it will reach a point where it, it the, the, the uh, bed uh, is so-called uh, retrograde bed. So it gets deeper. The, the Antarctic ice sheet sits on bedrock below sea level but it gets deeper as you go toward the center of the continent and it get it hits a canyon in uh, about 20 years if we continue at one kilometer uh, per year when it hits that canyon you're going to get very rapid disintegration of that glacier which is basically the cork that's holding the, uh, a lot of the west antarctic ice uh, in the bottle so we don't want to get there. And if we want to prevent, to slow down and even stop the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet, we'll have to cool off the planet. That's, uh, and, and we need to do that because more than half of the large global cities in the world are on coastlines and there are a lot of lowlands. Uh, so that, that's the tipping point which uh, I think dominates. But it so happens that there's so many other uh, climate impacts that we're beginning to see and which will be much more if we go beyond two degrees, that there are many reasons to want to cool off the planet. If we want to keep a planet that looks more or less like the one that has existed the last 10,000 years, we actually have to cool off the planet back to a Holocene level temperature. And that's possible but it's not easy. Maybe if you could just to say one more sentence on that, that is essentially uh, uh, Mr. De La Garza's question. What do you mean by cooling off the planet? I, I mean, cooling it back, you know, we, uh, it to comparable to what it was before the- But, but uh, how is the, is the question? Oh, how? Well, we sh we're going to have to reduce emissions as rapidly as practical because otherwise any artificial ways to cool the planet are going to be overwhelmed. Uh, but we know when Pinatubo went off, it put aerosols in the stratosphere, which we changed the planet's energy budget by three watts per meter square reduction. If you had that now, you know, that cool, that actually cools off the planet. That's more than enough to put you from warming into cooling so there are there are ways to do it uh it, and not just putting aerosols in the stratosphere there you can have uh autonomous sailboats putting uh sea salt in the atmosphere and seeding clouds which many people would consider more innocuous than putting aerosols in the stratosphere but Rather than describe those efforts as threatening geoengineering, we have to recognize we're geoengineering the planet right now. This is what we're doing with these huge greenhouse gas amounts in the atmosphere is forcing the planet at a rate 10 times greater than has ever occurred in the Earth's history as far as we know. We have to minimize that human-made geoengineering, and on a temporary time scale, that will probably require reflecting sunlight, just because of how difficult it is to get the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Oh, th we're not going to do such a thing this year or next year. People have to understand the situation. They have to see that the problem is getting worse and worse, and and we have to understand the implications better. But we should- we're, we're doing the opposite. I think that's that's important to, to make clear that we're now doing the opposite of, of uh, reflecting more sunlight. We are reflecting less sunlight. Yeah, we're that's why it's fire. become, that's why the warming rate is, in, is accelerating because we're actually yeah. decreasing human-made aerosols. Um, but when, when you, instead of, we have to compare the current geoengineering with the strong warming that that causes and all the problems that's going to cause it at low uh, latitudes and 
increased storms and increased uh, floods and things with the, the situation where we, we uh, bring the temperature back down and it may have regional effects, but overall the global climate effects are, are, are likely, are surely much less than if we continue on this path and get several degrees of global warming. If, if I might. Uh, yeah, uh, no, I think we're going to have to close because uh, we're uh, 10 minutes uh, after the hour. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody uh, for participating. Uh, please, uh, everybody, uh, uh, down, make sure that you have the, the paper. Uh, it is uh, an extraordinarily important uh, paper. Um, and we have a number of questions in chat, which we will uh, uh, convey to the authors, and I'm sure that uh, the authors will also be ready to follow up uh, with you directly uh, by uh, by email. Uh, and uh, if we could uh, put a link, uh, Allison, uh, in the chat for people to follow up directly uh, with you, so that we can help to intermediate uh, intermediate the questions. Uh, let me thank everybody uh, again, and uh, uh, we're in a in a grim situation, uh, and I think that's clear. Uh, it's even grimmer uh, that uh, the politicians uh, have failed uh, their responsibility uh, to uh, the world now for quite a long time. I, for one, am horrified to put them in a position of further engineering a, 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 a disaster when they can't even do the straightforward things but uh, that's a that's a time for another another talk uh, um, and and another uh, uh, another discussion. Uh, we we have a massive political failure. Our politicians like wars. Uh, they don't uh, want to save the planet in the right way. So let's uh, bring it to an end now. And uh, thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, George uh, Pushkar, uh, Leon, and Norman uh, for uh, a extremely important contribution to the scientific and to the public understanding. And uh, thanks to the colleagues uh, uh, at uh, the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network for arranging uh, this uh, conversation with the world leading climate scientists and uh, best wishes to everybody today. And bye bye. Thank you, Jeff, very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.